Amen. We are going to continue our sermon series, I Am. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John. We'll be in the Gospel of John chapter 8, and we'll look at verses 12 to 14 in just a, a few moments. I am the light of the world. Uh, this is the next I am statement where Jesus is trying to tell people exactly who he is. And he says, I am the light of the world. Now, light is very important to us, and we often take it for granted until we find ourselves without it. Does anybody know who Bear Grylls is? Uh, we were watching Man vs. Wild, and there's Man vs. Wild, or You vs. Wild, or It's Too Wild. There's all kinds of series. But you got this guy, and he's a survivalist, and he is out there in nature trying to make it uh, and get to an extraction point uh, and, and showing people how to survive. And he had a torch, and if you've seen this episode, he was going through a cave and trying to get to the other side. So he had light going into this cave, and then the light went out. And he's trying to feel his way through absolute darkness to get to the other side. And we were all watching it, and it was fine when you could see all these crazy things and bats and all this stuff when you were looking at them. But then all of a sudden, when you couldn't see them and you could just hear them, a lot of, uh, a lot of the folks watching in our room and our family got a little squirmish and squeamish and thought, I, I don't know if I can handle that or not. The reality is that our world is a very, very dark place. But light not some light, the light has come into the world. And that's who Jesus Christ is. So let's pray together, and then we'll read these verses. And I hope that they encourage you today. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that you're revealing to us who you are. And as you continue to teach us, Lord, you are the light of the world, and we need that light. And I'm praying right now, God, that you would chase the darkness from the shadows of our souls and you would fill us and flood us with your light and your truth. Teach us, God. We're willing to learn. Give me the words to say and how to say them today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me if you're able to stand? If not, keep your seats. We'll look at verses 12 to 14. It'll be on the screen for you if you need it. It's also on your sermon outline if you're with us in person. It says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world he who follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life so the pharisees said to him you're testifying about yourself your testimony is not true and jesus answered and said to them even if i testify about myself my my testimony is true for i know where i came from and where i am going but you do not know where i came from or where i am going you may be seated. All right, so we, as we've been walking through the Gospel of John together, notice that we have picked up on some major Old Testament wilderness reminders of how God dealt with his people. The comparison between manna and the bread of life that we saw in chapter 6. The comparison between water in the desert and the water of the Holy Spirit that we saw in chapter 7. And here we are in chapter 8, and we'll see a comparison with the pillar of fire that led the people through the wilderness and Jesus who is the light of the world. Now remember, we're in the Feast of the Tabernacles and it was also, or the Feast of Booths, and it was also known as the Festival or the Feast of Lights because so many of the ceremonies involved various lighting. And from John, from the very beginning of his gospel, he's wanting us to know who Jesus is. So, the first thing I see in these verses is the deliverer from darkness testifies. The deliverer from darkness testifies. He wants you to know who he is. And he wants you to know what he came to do. So Jesus Christ says, I am. This is that powerful, perfect statement that he's saying in case there's any confusion. I am who I am. And I am the light of the world. And they're saying, well, I don't know. I don't understand your testimony about you. He says, you don't know where I'm from and where I'm going. He came to illuminate them and to, to help them understand about God's kingdom and eternal life. And he was saying, you don't know where I'm from and, and you don't know where I'm going. And I came to tell you that where I am from is where I want you to be. And there's only one way to get there and that is through me, the light. 
that can guide you home to be with God forever. So he says, I want you to believe in me, follow me. As he called his disciples, follow me. I am the light. But they were misunderstanding who he was, and, and, and Jesus continually tried to help them understand the relationship he had to God the Father. Because they didn't understand that he was God the Son and could bring them to God the Father. So many of the things he did, they questioned and didn't understand because they were confused about how he was the deliverer and the Messiah that had finally come to release them from the darkness and from the sin that engulfed them all so the pharisees said well hey your claims invalid because there's no witnesses now jesus and the father made two witnesses and that's the number required by deuteronomy 19 15 so he's going to tell them no i testify the father testify testifies and you you should know that i really am the light uh, he had already talked to about himself and said listen i'm not just speaking on my, my behalf I'm coming on behalf of God the Father, and you need to understand. And in chapter 5, if you were with us, you remember that he talked about other testimony. He talked about John the Baptist. He talked about his works. He talks about the Father. He talks about Scripture. He says, all of these testify that what I'm saying is true. My works back up because I'm doing things that only God can do. But they still question and doubt him. Now, I mentioned this, where did Jesus say this? I think it's really important because we talked last week about the text we looked at and how in the oldest manuscripts it was not there. So I still think we are in the Feast of the Tabernacles. I still think he's right there and he talked about the water. And now if you glance down at chapter 8 verse 20, you see where he's standing right now as he speaks. Again, he speaks to them, but this is where he's standing. It says, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So the temple treasury, uh, this area was where there were 13 collection boxes. They were called the shofar chests or the trumpet chests because there were collection boxes for the offering and they looked like trumpets. The way they were shaped, larger on one end and they come down to a to the box the collection box at the bottom so there's 13 of these he's standing in this part of the treasury where they would come in the court of women and give their offerings what i think is super important about where he's standing right now is because he's standing here amongst these chests it's the festival of lights and there are giant candelabra that are pushing light out everywhere these massive candles and torches or candelabra is lit like the menorah there's there's massive light flooding the temple and it was huge and everyone that would come to this feast the festival of lights would see the lighting ceremonies and see this glorious light flooding the temple and it was everywhere uh bruce ff F. bruce talks about how so brilliant was their light that one ancient jewish source declared there was not a courtyard in jerusalem that did not reflect their light so water is there and light is there and jesus is standing there and then he starts talking and says i am the light of the world you're looking at these external symbols and things that point to my glory but i'm telling you i'm the glory and i'm right here i'm the light of the world don't look to this because those lamps would be extinguished at the end of the festival. He says, look to me and follow me and you will find life and hope. And I just love the picture of this. He's crying out to all of us and he's saying, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Akalutheo, the the word here he follows sometimes there were those that were following jesus but specifically it refers to those that are going to follow him and become a true disciple of him follow me follow me the one who follows me will no longer walk in darkness but will have the light of life that's what we have to do the second thing i see is deception of the darkness is dispelled at right, the deliverer from the darkness testifies who he is and why he's here 
And then now the deception of the darkness begins to be dispelled because he keeps teaching them. Look at the next thing he says. Verse 15 says, You judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone in it. But I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it's been written that the testimony of two is true. Two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And he, these words he spoke in the treasure and he taught, as he taught in the temple, and no one sees him because his hour had not yet come. So immediately they are questioning his authority. What right do you have to do this? And Jesus says, you don't understand. If you knew me, you knew the Father. I, I'm not coming and speaking to you something new. These are the Old Testament prophets talked about this. The Father has been telling you this day is coming. I'm simply telling you that that day is today. You've been waiting for light. You've been waiting for deliverance. You've been cursing the darkness and frustration. And I'm here to tell you that I am light personified right here. And I'll lead you out of this darkness forever. And they were like, well, who's your father? And what's going on? And they're, they're, they're questioning all these things. Now, we just looked at those previous verses that we read. And Jesus first supports his claim by referring to his divine origin and destiny. He says, I know where, I'm come, where I've come from. He became flesh and dwelt among us. He left heaven to come and redeem us. And now he's saying, I am going back. You can't come with me unless you come my way. We're going to get to that. It's pretty significant. So you don't know where I'm from. You don't know where I'm going. He's saying they were ignorant of both of these things. The Pharisees didn't really understand. And then now he says, I'm going to explain to you that you're judging according to the flesh. Verse 15. You're judging according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. Again, they use the earthly standards of sinful men in a fallen world. They understood nothing about Jesus' heavenly origin. And everything they assumed about him was wrong. <clears throat> so he's trying to illuminate them. He's dispelling the darkness and trying to tell them the truth. Some of them just didn't want to hear it. And that's the way the world is today too. You can tell someone the truth and they'll prefer to stay in the lie because they've become comfortable in the lie. But that's a dangerous comfort. It's a scary place to be because we get used to just dwelling in sin and rejecting the holiness of God. We can't stay there. The next thing he says, he says, I'm not judging anyone. What does he mean by that? There's really two ways we can interpret this, and scholars differ, but I think both of them have some truth that we could explain. Number one, he may have meant that he did not judge anyone according to the flesh, or superficially or externally the way they were judging people. A D.A. Carson holds that view, and that, and that could very well be. On the other hand, he may mean that he did not come to judge anyone yet, and the emphasis is on the yet, because God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We've already seen that in chapter 3, 17, so that's consistent. He's, it's, now is not the time of final judgment. Now is the time of eternal deliverance. And he said, I've, I've come to save you. I've come to lead you. I am the one that will lead you through the wilderness right now. You, you, your ancestors followed this pillar of fire, but I'm telling you, I am the light that will lead you to eternity with the Father. Next, his support was his credibility, was his divine nature. He said, I'm not judging you right now, but if I did judge you, I'd be right. Isn't that what he just said? I, I think that's kind of cool. He's, he's like, you know what? Even if I do judge, in verse 16, I'm not alone in it because it's the Father that sent me. You and I, if we spoke that way, we'd be pretty arrogant. The Son of God says that he is dispelling darkness and trying to tell him the truth. He's saying, look, what I'm telling you is right. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to deceive you. I am point blank telling you that you need me and you don't even know how much you need me. I am the light of the world. And you've been walking in darkness for too long. So, 
the next thing he says is that, all right, I understand what you're saying. You're saying I'm an only witness, but just understand that the Father is also testifying through me. And what, what I'm saying is true. He is not the only witness. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. And they say, where is your Father? Where is your Father? I think this is really important because he's going to tell them where I'm going, you can't go without me. Where he came from was heaven and dwelt on earth. Where he's returning after the resurrection is heaven. Where's your father? The father is in heaven. Where's the son? He's seated right now at the right hand of the father. And he's already made a path for you to walk to come with him forever. It, it's plain. It's well lit. It's the gospel. And it's been preserved for thousands of years for you to read today and to know. But right now, he, where is your father? He says, you know, you neither know my father or me. He says, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And no one laid hold of him because his hour had not yet come. Where he was standing right now in this, the, the court of women where he was standing in the treasury, it was right there where the Sanhedrin would meet. It's within when earshot. Everything he said they could hear. And yet the hour for his death had not yet come and they couldn't force that hour yet. But that hour was coming and Jesus was telling them about it right there. He illuminated his judgment, his authority to judge sin and darkness. He said, there will it, I'm not judging now, but he will judge. And he was going to lay the criteria out as we already talked about for what that comes from. Then he starts to mock their unbelief. The unbelievers, they, they don't know him. They don't know God. If they knew him, they would know God because God is him and in him. So sometimes we just need a little light shed on a situation. And it doesn't even have to be much. If you light a single match in a dark room, you begin to see some things a little more clearly. And some of us have had so much darkness in our life so many people have lied to us and discouraged us that we can barely see anything at all but if that one light begins to flicker it will help us to see it'll help us to see a path my youngest boy's room is pretty messy they cleaned it up this morning and i was glad for that uh, they have a night light it's very small but that night light helps them to navigate their room and without that, there's lots of clumping and clattering and scaredness and what's the shadow and what's this. But that one little nightlight in the bathroom and that one little nightlight in their room illuminates two points that they might need to walk in the middle of the night, how to get from here to there. And right now, you may not have everything figured out. You just know that you need some points of reference. And I want to tell you, God's Word is that point of reference. It can help you from where you are to get to where you need to be but you have to be willing to walk the path. And if you want to learn more, God will teach you more. But if you're prideful and arrogant and you will not humble yourself, you will not learn much. And the problem with the Pharisees was that they were certain that they had it figured out. They were certain that they were not in darkness. And they were wrong. So let's look at this. And if you're struggling with anything right now, I would encourage you to ask God to shine a little bit of light on that circumstance. God, I'm not seeing this the way I need to see it, God. Could you help me to see it more clearly? If you pray that way, God will answer that prayer. If you really want to know the will of God, he'll reveal the will of God. He's not hiding from you, and he's not trying to hide the right path from you. So if you say, God, please, I really want to know what to do in this situation. Light my path, he will do so. Third truth. The dark fate of dying in sin is revealed. Now remember, we've talked about the deliverer from darkness. He testifies how the deliverance comes. Second, the deception of the darkness is dispelled. They question his authority to do these things. And he said, I have all authority. I'm telling you the truth. This is the only way. And then we see, finally, the dark fate of dying in sin. Despite all of this, there are those that wouldn't believe and would reject what he was going to say and what he had already said. Look at verses 21 to 30, and this will be the last verses we look at today. It says, Then he said again to them, I go away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. 
So the Jews were saying, Surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, Where I'm going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless, please circle that if you circle in your Bible. And if not, focus on that. He says, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to them, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you. Again, that's coming. But he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. And they did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And I do nothing on my own initiative. But I speak the things, I speak these things as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. As He spoke these things, many came to believe in Him. That's awesome. That, that's the Gospel. That's the hope. There are places in Scripture where it's plainly laid out. And it dispels all lies or beliefs that perhaps there's multiple ways to get there or that surely there won't be separation based on our belief in Christ. There will. There's everlasting judgment or everlasting life. And the only difference between those two groups of people are what they believe about the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's it. None of our works can get us there. None of our self-righteousness does anything for us. It is by faith in Christ and by His grace that we are redeemed. He gives us this announcement. And He says, I am going away and you're going to seek Me and you'll die in your own sins because where I'm going you cannot come. Why can they not come? Because they're unwilling to follow His way. They want to go a different path, and there's not another path that will work. If another path would work, the cross would be totally unnecessary, but it is not. It had to happen. We sinned. We're sinners by nature and by choice. We broke our relationship with the Father, and He died to restore that relationship in full to us. He says, I'm going away. You're going to seek me. And where I'm going, you cannot come. So when he's telling them, in, in, in verse 23, he says, you're from below, I'm from above. He, he's not saying that they're demonic. He's saying that they're of the world. They're from below. They're from here. And, and a lot of what they did with the law of God is they added their own interpretations of the law and how to fulfill it. They had added all these worldly things and stacked on all of these requirements. They were worldly. He says, you're of the world. And you're trying to find a worldly path to get there. Self-righteousness. Works-based righteousness. I'm keeping the law and all this minutia. And even though I'm doing these simple things in my heart and mind, externally I'm doing these things, so that should cover for it. And we're going to balance the good with the bad. And if I, my, my good outweighs my bad, then I'm, I'm okay. And I'm, I'm not as bad as them. So comparative righteousness. All these worldly comparisons he's saying... No, none of that will get you to heaven. None of it. Where I'm going, you can't go because you're trying these other paths. Unless, and we'll come back to that, he says there is a way. You'll die in, in your sins in verse 21. You'll die in your sin. And that, that sin of unbelief causes all of these other sins too. It's that one sin of unbelief, unbelief in Jesus Christ that causes us down all of these paths of following after these terrible things and thinking they're going to change our life and they won't. 
we, it compiles, and like the prodigal son we've been studying on Wednesday nights, we just run further and further away from the Father. We're unbelieving. It says, you will die in your sins in verse 24. Unless you believe that I am He. Now, that word He doesn't appear in the Greek text. What He says, unless you believe that I am. This is exactly like in Exodus where Moses was wondering, who am I going to tell them sent me when I go back to deliver your people? You tell them that I am sent you. And that's what we see here in the Greek. There's no he there in Greek. He said, unless you believe that I am, that God, his name, his divine name, unless you believe that I am God, Jesus says, then you're trapped in unbelief and you can't go where I'm going. He's Yahweh. So sacred the Jews wouldn't even pronounce it. He says, I am. I'm the one you're looking for. Unless, that, that verse is so important. If you try any other things, it won't work. Unless you come to Him. This is our hope. Unless you believe that I am He. If you believe that I am He, then you're saved forever. If you believe that He's the Son of God and you put your faith and your trust in Him, then you are delivered and redeemed and guided and blessed for the rest of your life, and then you're with Him to worship for all of eternity forever. That's the big switch. That is what we have to understand, not just intellectually, but in our hearts and spiritually. We have to take this leap of faith. We have to say, I believe, I need you. You repent of your sins. You put your faith in Christ. You're born again, and now He leads you in His light to live forever. In the midst of all of these things, they ask this question, and the truth is that even when we hear the truth, sometimes we still doubt or or wonder if there's more we have to learn and figure out first. You, You don't. You just have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You don't have to know everything about Him to know you need Him, and if you come to Him, you're saved. They ask Him this question again, who are you? Who are you? And He says, I am who I've been telling you I am from the very beginning. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Deliverer. I am the One. It is so amazing what He says. What I've been saying to you from the very beginning, that's who I am. I am God in the flesh come to save you. Verse 30 says, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. There are those there that at that moment, they finally, like the light switch in their soul was turned on, they finally got it and said, I believe, I will follow you. You are the Messiah. You are the light of the world. And they were saved at that moment forevermore. And once you become a believer and a follower of Christ, he sends you out to be salt and light in the world. But he is the light. He, he, we're born again and given life in him. And then once we have that, he sends us out to let other people know who he is, where he came from, where he went back to, and how they can get there. And you get to be part of dispersing light to the world, the the four corners of the earth, that every tribe, tongue, and nation will hear the gospel and be saved. That's why it's so exciting for us to be on mission with God and sending missionaries and being missionaries and supporting and praying for missionaries because this light needs to spread. The gospel needs to go. And then the more you stay connected with God, the more your light shines brighter for Him in a world that is so dark. I don't know why I thought of this again, and some of you have seen it, but they bought me a spotlight when we go to the beach so that we can go crab hunting, and it's bright. So we shine this across the sand, and we can see the little crabs and run out there and get them. It's got a cable, a USB cable that plugs into the wall. When you charge this thing up, it's really bright. But the longer I leave it unplugged from the wall, the more it drops. Right now it has up to 750 lumens 
the longer I leave it unplugged, the dimmer it gets. And I thought about how important it is that we have a strong connection with God. Because this whole time, the Son of God was talking about his unbreakable connection to God the Father. They are the same, one. One God and three persons, they're constantly connected. I'm not by myself. My Father is with me. When I speak to you, the Father speaks to you. Jesus is saying all these things, and they're so connected together. And he says, if you want to be light in the world, then you, as my disciple, need to stay connected to me. Let me tell you something that I've come to believe. You're not light enough on your own. And you need more of Jesus in your life than just Sunday morning. Because by Monday or Tuesday, some of you are pretty grumpy, and I can already tell you need a recharge. Daily bread. Daily prayer. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, fueling your faith. And you become a bright light in a dark world. Apart from Him, you can do nothing. But in Him, abiding in Him, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Connect to Christ. And help the world connect to Christ. And your life will not be in vain. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for the love and the hope that we have in You. Right now, God, you may be speaking to those that need to make decisions. Those that need to recommit their life to you. Those that need to trust you as Lord and Savior. Those that may need to be baptized or maybe unite with the church family. I know that you're talking to all of us. And I know that your word demands a response. So whatever it is we need to do now, God, give us the faith to do it. And we'll give you the glory for what you're going to do in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.